Uh, the younger daughter, Masha, who's two and a half, she actually recorded a video saying thank you to you. So uh, your producers have it, and uh, they'll share it with you at some point. Oh, um, I want to see it. I want to see it. Oh, there it there is. You go. Now, can we? Is it okay if we play it on TV? Sure, sure. Okay. All right. Let me see it. This is the first I've seen it. I love you, America. I love you, America. <laughs> America. <laughs> what? What? So I'm not you. <laughs> you tell her she doesn't that when, know that much English. So. It was beautiful. You tell her when this is done, I'll take her to Disneyland. We're going Disney uh, World. Disney please, World. Please, please, please do. I'll, I'll, I'll happily join, as you can imagine, or Universal. <laughs> um, but uh, the older daughter, I mean, she's had this surreal experience as well. So basically, because I do a lot of interviews on American TV, she reached out to, to me. She kind of she grabbed my arm and said, "Like, Dad, I want to talk to you." And I go, "Like, what happened?" She goes, "Like." Why, you know, why are you telling me that Americans support us when they don't? And, you know, as you can imagine, being a former advisor on the U.S.-Ukraine relationship, that kind of surprised me. Turns out she is watching Tucker Carlson. Uh, Tucker Carlson is you know, probably not your typical American. So now just imagine the predicament that I was in, trying to explain you know, the phenomenon of Tucker Carlson to a 13-year-old Ukrainian girl who's under bombardment. Um, so just a quick message to him. Uh, we'd be happy to welcome him at our house in Kiev and kind of see if he still sticks by his beliefs. So that's how my family is doing. What would you say to him? Look, I'm, I, I, I don't want to argue with him. I just want to invite him to Kiev. I mean, if he com calls himself a journalist or, you know, there's a tiny bit of journalist in there, you know, why not come and see firsthand, you know, what's happening and then form an opinion? Because, uh, like, look, kids are watching him in Ukraine. And, you know, it's really difficult to explain to a Ukrainian teenager who's under constant stress and fire that, you know, um, there, there are there, there are more arguments in this conversation that you know that that she knows, and she's as sincere as she gets. Uh, by the way, another interesting story. I'm I'm trying to keep positive. So people ask me why I keep smiling, and I think like, look, one of the wars that's happening at the moment is against our positivity and human nature. So you know, I take every opportunity to kind of to go to try and put a smile, if not on my face, then on other people's faces. So look, there was a baby born in a bomb shelter two doors down from us. And, you know, we spent the day today, kind of, the entire community was still, like collecting different things, you know, baby food and, you know, clothes. And it, it, it's beautiful. Like, look, I mean, it shouldn't happen, but when it happens, you know, you have to see the positive in it. So it's, it's truly incredible. Can we go back to the chemical weapons story? Obviously, it's a huge story here. This is Russian disinformation being amplified. And I'm guessing this is why your 13-year-old knows who Tucker Carlson is by, by one American journalist, but not the vast majority of them. Um, the, the, the American ambassador to the United Nations um, has been knocking it down today. The American Department of Defense, the State Department, the CIA director, the director of national intelligence have all called this out for what it is, Russian propaganda. But, but the scariest thing is that they seem to leave open the possibility that it's some sort of projection, that, that Putin is accusing Ukraine of having or planning to use bioweapons because he plans to use them himself. And you said you were teaching your daughters through poems what to do. Is, is that a real fear? Well, um, there are two factors that kind of unnerve me to do with, like, you know, potential chemical weapons attacks. So, first of all, I mean, we've been proven wrong time and time again uh, uh, about the fact that Putin, you know, has red lines. He doesn't. You know, we've seen maternity wards bombarded, and then we've seen the foreign minister claim that he was all set up and we fired the model. You know, by the way, she gave birth to a baby girl today, and there are pictures. So, just in case, you know, Russian foreign ministry is watching. Uh, so, um, so they they've kind of you know we have mass graves in the middle of like you know bustling cities or what used to be bustling cities like two weeks ago. So that kind of makes you wonder where he stops, and I don't think he stops at you know chemical weapons. Secondly, you know the, his obsession with Kiev. I fully agree with uh, Richard, who was on before me. Um, it's impossible to take Kiev with conventional weapons and with what Putin's got on the ground in Ukraine at the moment. I mean, it's a city. Half the population have left, but it's still nearly two million people in there. There are plenty of guns. There are plenty of you know high-rise buildings. You know the streets are chaotic. Uh, the city has been preparing for two weeks. So you simply you can't take a city like that. I mean Hitler used nearly a million people to try and take Kharkiv that Putin is trying to take now. So 
if he's still adamant, you know, that it, about the fact that he wants to take it, it makes you wonder how. Because, you know, that use of chemical weapons could be that advantage he will use. But at the same time, you know, like, look, the sto also the stories they push. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, pigeons bombing Russian cities with, like, viruses is just, you know, it's a bit too much even for me, you know. Uh, and I've been dealing with disinformation for, like, five years now. What is it? I mean, that's a harrowing scenario you just outlined, that he's still intent on taking Kiev and... It's, I mean, as you said, you've had two weeks to prepare. The convoy seemed to stall. Um, and it is one scenario that you have to at least contemplate. W what, does that, what does that do to you as a, as a Ukrainian, as a former advisor to the president, and as a father to even have to contemplate that? Well, personally, I mean, we had a conversation with my wife yesterday and like, look, I said to her that, you know, there is a line that we're not going to cross. So if it gets too dangerous, if we potentially looking at chemical weapons, you're leaving for Western Ukraine. So, you know, she, she's asked for some more time and, you know, it's quiet at the moment. So as long as she has an escape route, she can stay. So and the, the girls can stay. That's my position. I'm staying. Now, the most important lesson here, and I finally figured out how to answer you know the favorite question of every interviewer you know everyone keeps asking why is Zelensky like that you know why are you like that you know are you insane why don't you just like move to Poland so it's like to LA somewhere and just you know start afresh well look uh the best people to talk to that about would be American veterans so why don't you just ask them why fight for your country why why not just move to Mexico if there's a threat why kind of protect your people why protect your women and children i mean like look it's not zelensky or me you need to be asking you need to be asking your veterans and you know kudos to america i mean you you you're just like us in that sense i mean you kind of you cherish and respect and support your veterans so talk to them they'll explain to you why we're why ukrainians are like that and why american soldiers are like that so that's the best way i can answer that question Former uh, U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Ivanovich, who was um, terribly maligned by our ex-president, Donald Trump, actually made the same point, that um, you, you value your freedom in a way that American history suggests we should all value ours. I'm not a positive. We're, we're not at our brightest point right now as, as a country, as I'm sure you know. I, I, I want to... We have a, a shot up um, through most of this interview of Kyiv, and... There's a palpable sense among the press that covers you know, the Pentagon and the State Department here of, of real anxiety and, and fear as um, today sort of turned to night as these two attacks from Putin that were not on the front lines took place, as the wreckage in Mariupol becomes clear, um, as the targeting of civilians becomes obvious and, and indisputable. And as the arrest of, of some museum directors and others in, in places where, the, where Putin has gained an advantage, can you give me a sense of sort of the, 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 the damage that your country has suffered over the last 14 days? Well, uh, there are two kinds of levels and dimensions to that damage. First of all, you know, physically and infrastructurally, we've lost our best people. We've seen numerous civilian deaths. And, you know, as our defense minister mentioned, you know, yesterday, Russia has actually killed more civilians than soldiers in Ukraine. And they are doing that deliberately. We're seeing that now from the pattern, you know, that they follow. Plus, they, they're kind of planning to invite foreign mercenaries from Syria to, to kill Ukrainians. I mean, you know, the masks are off. It's, it's not about, you know, demilitarizations. It's not about, you know, classical, you know, conventional geopolitics. It's a massacre. It's, uh, it's genocide. And by the way, funny story. I mean, I'm trying to see positivity and everything. We have some intercepts of those Syrian mercenaries. And, you know, there's chatter among them that they're going to enter Ukraine. They're going to surrender. And they want to run to the EU as refugees. So, you know, Putin can be in for a very unpleasant surprise and, you know, and be out of a lot of money. But look, the situation is terrible. Plus, infrastructurally, uh, you know, they're literally like leveling everything they see inside. They're destroying churches. They're destroying schools. I mean, they've destroyed more schools and hospitals than they have military bases and airports. 
So that kind of tells the story. And there's an important kind of morale to this story. Um, you, you know, that there's a certain lesson to be learned. Like, look, everyone in the West keep talking about, you know, where do we draw the line? World War Three. we don't want to provoke Putin. Look, for Putin, provocation is a non sequitur. I mean, it, it just doesn't work in, you know, in his world. If he yeah. wants to fight with you, if he wants a war with you, he'll go to war with you over sanctions, over something else, over some, you know, weaponized pigeons or whatever. So, like, look, <laughs> there are only two possible scenarios here. Either he's completely unhinged, and therefore, you know, there's no need to be afraid of provoking him. He'll provoke himself. Or he's absolutely sane and methodical and evil. And basically, he's playing you for a fool. He wants you to be afraid of him so he can reset Google Maps back to 1945. You, in either case, you're going to be fighting him at some point. Why not do it now and save our civilians? You know, uh, that that's one thing that kind of I can't understand. And the second thing I can't understand is why does multinational b business stay in Russia? I mean, now we're kind of we're trying to speak with like international law firms like, you know, White and Case and whatnot. Yeah, they, they, they're like they're saying, no, we're going to stay in Russia. I mean, guys, you, you're you're paying taxes so we can get bombed. I mean, it's like dealing with Al Qaeda after 9-11. It's just like. So we'll probably need your help, kind of try and speak with them, try and kind of reason with them, because we're giving up on that front, to be honest. It's just, there's no way a rational Ukrainian can understand why that's the case. <laughs>